I should be faster after all these months of speaking in this horrible way. All right, what I thought I would do today is I will go over very briefly the background to the GGE because I, you know, I'm acutely aware in this particular audience that most of the folks are familiar uh, with, uh, with what the GGE, the Group of Governmental Experts on ICT has been doing uh, since 2004. So let me very briefly do some introductory material and then I'll turn to the most recent GGE and also, Tal has mentioned that I might uh, comment on the recent uh, Israeli statement on international law that my friend Roy Schorndorf uh, uh, talked about here at the United States Naval War College, where I am now. So I'll talk about my reflections on the Israeli position. I think what we must understand about this body of law is, is this is a really new body of law. So there's a lot of uncertainty, but we should not be surprised. I mean, I'm an IHL guy, and we've been doing IHL for uh, a period measured in centuries. But really, the law of cyber started, in fact, right here at the United States Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, back in the late 1990s, when the very first conference was, was held on the issue of international law and cyber. In those days, we didn't even use the word cyber. We talked about computer network attack and computer network exploitation, but the term cyber came much, much later. We, there was some progress in law made, and I was involved in it a little bit uh, with regard to the production of the first Stalin manual in 2013, and then the second one in 2017, the first dealing with use of force, uh, Tallinn 2.0 expanding coverage to peacetime law. Uh, there were major events, Estonia and Georgia in 2007 and 2008, that focused our attention, attention on this body of law. But really, in terms of law, this is very, very, very new. Uh, maturity has only been, been reached, I think, in, say, the last five or six years. Now, there are debates about how should we approach this relatively new phenomenon, cyber, and with regard to those debates, the big one is this. Do we need new law or does the old law work? I have to tell you, I'm of the view uh, that we should be focusing on the old law, the law that predated in most cases, uh, the advent of cyber. Why? Well, Australia and the United States have given two different reasons, both of which make sense. The first, uh, Australia tells us, listen, I know that some folks want to, want to move towards a treaty. Russia and China, for example, moving towards a consensus treaty on cybercrime in the United Nations. But the problem is the nature of treaties is that they are compromised documents. And so we might actually risk dumbing down the law. With the give and take of negotiations, we may end up with a treaty provision that's less robust than the customary law that already exists. And then there's the American uh, argument, which I also buy into. And the American argument is kind of simple. The American argument says, listen, before you decide what you want, you need to decide what you have. So let's finish the task of achieving consensus to the extent possible, on the major issues of international cyber law, how, how international law applies in the cyber context. And then we will know if there is a requirement for treaty law. The other dynamic that is animating this discussion deals with customary law. And I, I see a lot of it. I see a lot of this going on. Folks are of the impression that we have to look for state practice and opinio juris with respect to customary law as it applies in cyberspace. Well, that's actually very true if you're looking for the crystallization of new rules and you'll be sorely disappointed for lots of reasons, not only different interpretations of the law, but because much of the activity in cyberspace, as all of you know, occurs behind the curtain. We don't know in the open source uh, materials exactly what. GCHQ is doing, uh, NSA, and so forth. In fact, what we should be talking about 
is the dynamic of interpretation of customary law. That's what we're really talking about. So to give you an example, I have one here. If you wanted to argue that there is a rule of international law, a customary rule of international law that prohibits operations against critical infrastructure, that would be a new norm. There's no such rule out there. There are rules, in my view, that say, listen, a cyber attack against critical infrastructure may be, for instance, a violation of sovereignty. It may be a use of force, but there's no rule specific to critical infrastructure. That's crystallization. That's the creation of a new norm. However, if we're dealing with the issue of sovereignty, which I believe to be an existing norm, and we look at the French statement, which says that, that if you come into France, if you conduct remote operations into France, and you affect French government infrastructure, or you cause effects on the territory of France, that's a violation of sovereignty. That's an interpretation by a state of an existing norm. And states have a lot more leeway in that regard. We'll talk about that when we get to the Israeli case. Now, again, this is very basic background for, for folks uh, affiliated with this center. There have been six GGEs. Two of them before this one were important. The one that finished in 2013 and the one that finished in 2015, they both issued reports. The one that finished in 2017 is important because it did not issue a report. Reports of the GGE, the group of governmental experts requires consensus and consensus could not be achieved. GGE reports do really two things for, for our purposes. The first is they identify rules of international law. So that happened in 2013. Those rules were developed further in 2014, 15. You see some of them here. Some are, are completely uncontroversial. Establishing jurisdiction. Of course, the international law of jurisdiction applies with regard to cyber operations. The one on human rights is interesting because in 2013, the statement had only said that states are obligated to respect human rights. And in 2015's report, you'll note it says respect and protect. So now we see both the negative and the positive obligation. Uh, you see, for example, humanitarian, uh, humanity necessity and so forth. These are the rules of IHL. So things are going good. The report issues some rules. And these reports also identify what are called voluntary non-binding norms of responsible state behavior. These are non-binding norms, but you need to be careful when you look at these non-binding norms because the only reason they are styled as non-binding is because consensus could not be achieved on the binding nature of the rule. So if we look at the very last one, I'll talk about this uh, further as we proceed. This is really a rule of due diligence. You must not knowingly allow the territory to be used for internationally wrongful acts against uh, information and communications technology. There were states that were participating in the GG in 2015 that believed it was a rule of law. However, because consensus could not be achieved among all the states in the GGE, it had to be crafted as a non-binding, as a should obligation. So you need to be careful. In this most recent, and I won't talk about it because the focus here is law, but in this most recent GGE report that was issued, 2021 report, the GGE does a lot of work with voluntary non-binding norms of responsible state behavior. So they take these 2015 norms and they discuss them. So the 2021 20, uh, report is extraordinarily important because it adds flesh on the bones of the non-binding norms set forth in 2015. Now, along comes 2016, everything's going great. 2013 report, 2015, another report and it's more robust. Along comes 2016, 26, uh, 17, and there is no report that issued there. Now, when I talked to folks that were on the GGE, they believe a lot of progress was made on uh, finding accommodations among states, but there were three obstacles to the issuance of a report. The first, and, and I'll talk about that, the first is uh, a reference to what can only be described as countermeasures, the right to respond to internationally wrongful act countermeasures. Uh, the 
the not the right of self-defense, but actually including the term self-defense in the report. And then finally, inclusion of the term international humanitarian law in the report, which is very curious because if you remember in 2015, we see the principles of humanitarian law, uh, humanity, necessity, proportionality, distinction. We see those principles cited expressly, but here, uh, China, Russia, Cuba, and some other folks did not want to include the term itself. A lot of us thought, well, that's it. I mean, you know, we, we had 2013, we have 2015. This means that this process is over. And now we will look to states to articulate their views. But both the Russians and the Americans pressed forward. The Americans uh, pushed for another GGE and got it. The Russians were initially on board with another GGE, but then they changed their mind and they said, what we really would like is what's called an open-ended working group. The different, they have the same mandate, roughly the same mandate. The difference is the GGE was limited to 25 states selected on the basis of geographical representation. Whereas the, and their reports are always adopted by the General Assembly, the OEWG was open to everybody, was open to everybody. And so these two processes proceeded in parallel. I won't talk about the OEWG. I will tell you that the good thing has, I travel around the world, I'm involved in a project where I do training uh, on cyber for government officials. In fact, currently today, we're, in fact, Yuval will speak to a group uh, that we're doing it with in the Caribbean government officials there. There is a sense that the inclusion in the OEWG was very important for them, an opportunity for them to express their views because with only 25 states in the GG, it's hard to get in the door there. So if only for the purpose of inclusion, the OEWG was important. I have to tell you that the report itself was relatively unexceptional. If you're interested in the OEWG, you probably want to look at the chair summary, Switzerland chaired. And so there's some good discussion of IHL in the chair summary being Swiss after all. Uh, the assessment of this process, I think it was successful. Why? Because you had all the five P, the P5 sitting there, the permanent five members sitting around a table at a time where we kind of sort of hate each other. Okay, this is not a good time for US Russian relations, uh, the US Chinese relations. Nevertheless, crafted agreement on how norms apply in cyberspace. And, and as you'll see, not a very robust agreement, but we nevertheless achieved agreement. We're back in the game. And that is particularly important, not only because there's a lot of tension between among the P5 now. But remember, it comes on the heels of a failure of a GG that could not agree on some basic issues as does self-defense apply? Do we want to include the word self-defense? Should we include the term international humanitarian law? So bravo to the, to the, to the ambassadors and uh, others who represented their nations at the GG. Now, on the other hand, as an international law attorney like you, I'm kind of disappointed in the report. I didn't expect more. But we have to admit that it didn't carve out a lot of new ground. And so what this tells us is that what we should be doing is we should be tracking the activity of states uh, like Israel, like uh, Roy's statement here at the Naval War College, uh, very carefully. And we should be looking at like-minded groups. And the most significant in this regard is NATO, in my view, uh, if you look, for example, I, I wrote this morning a blog for EGIL Talk uh, on the NATO Brussels statement. You know, it's an important statement with regard to cyber. So we'll and, and the issuance of NATO cyber doctrine, equally important. Okay, what's noteworthy about the, about the GGE statement? First, humanitarian law. It's crystal clear, and they use the term that humanitarian law applies when you have an armed conflict all of its principles apply. And correctly, the real issue is not whether IHL applies, but how does it apply? I think the discussion we have been having about the application of IHL is counter-normative, uh, I would say, in a distinguished audience like this, 
if I were talking to my friend Danny uh, alone over dinner, I would tell him that was a ridiculous, silly discussion. Of course it applies. But there remains, as the GGE says, there remain lots of important issues. What's the threshold for armed conflict when you're talking only cyber? Does it make a difference, IAC and NIAC? What's an attack? What's data? Uh, is data an object? What's the geography of war? If I'm involved in a NIAC with a, a non-state actor, an organized armed group, and I'm taking hits from halfway around the world, do I look to IHL to craft my response or not? So lots of open issues here. Then there's my favorite issue, which is sovereignty. Uh, this was unaddressed directly in the report. And the issue is, is sovereignty a rule in other words, a primary rule of international law that governs the activities of states in cyberspace, or alternatively, is it a principle from which other rules derive? Rules like intervention, rules like the use of force. Now, I have to tell you, I think this is a, a, a confusing, curious, a discussion when we did both tall and manuals, all the experts agreed that sovereignty was a rule. When I was practicing law, when I was ORI for the United States Air Force and Soviet or East German jets crossed across the inner German border, we talked about a violation of the sovereignty of the Federal Republic of Germany. I mean, this wasn't hard. So we all agreed there was a role of sovereignty. We took it to states in Tallinn too. 50 states came around the table in, in The Hague and we presented our findings before we published. Not a word, not one state pushed back on the notion that sovereignty is a rule. But of course, as, as most of you know, in 2018, Jeremy Wright, who was then the attorney general in the UK, uh, proclaimed that sovereignty is not a rule of international law. We all kind of thought, whoa, I think he read the speech wrong. Uh, but then uh, our friends uh, in the United Kingdom said, no, no, he read it right. And we asked, well, does he mean like just in cyberspace? Or does he mean there's no rule of sovereignty? And we were told by our, our friends in FCO and MOD, no, no, he means there's no rule of sovereignty, which at that point uh, started a feeding frenzy for uh, the international law community saying, you've got to be kidding me. Here's the history. I wrote a long article for the Texas Law Review on that. Now, uh, it remains the only state that's taken this view. Every state that has spoken to the issue since then, every single one has taken the view that there is a rule of sovereignty. Very interesting. This includes NATO in the recently released uh, doctrine, uh, Allied Joint Publication 3.20. Uh, 3.20 specifically says sovereignty is a rule. And interestingly, the United Kingdom actually reserved to the doctrine. By the way, uh, for those of you who do, do mill it, that's weird. You don't usually issue a reservation to, uh, to alliance doctrine, but there is one reservation. It is the UK, and it was a reservation to the footnote addressing sovereignty. What's more noteworthy is not the reservation of the UK, but the failure of, for example, the United States not to join the UK on the reservation. In other words, the United States is accepting doctrine which says sovereignty is a rule, along with other states that have not spoken to it, like Canada, as an example. I think states, some, some states, the United States, Israel, uh, have not opined on this because they're conflicted. I mean, you know, in life, what you see depends on where you stand. And if it's a situation where you're taking a lot of hits, then you should embrace sovereignty because sovereignty allows you to name and shame and allows you to take countermeasures because remember a condition precedent to countermeasures is an internationally wrongful act. If there's a breach of sovereignty, you've got your internationally wrongful act and you may now engage in countermeasures. On the other hand, if you're a state that is active in the cyberspace of other countries, this should make you nervous. Now, my argument is when I talk to the Brits is I get it. I was born at night, but it wasn't exactly last night. I understand that in some circumstances, if there's a rule of sovereignty, 
This will preclude the, the right uh, of uh, GCHQ to conduct operations that are, that are necessary for their national security interest, for the national security interest of the United Kingdom. But on the other hand, if, if, you, if you don't have sovereignty, then you're taking off the table any countermeasure except an in-kind cyber response, which is problematic for many countries. Um, and you, you forfeit name and shame. So when, for example, WannaCry is conducted and the National Health Service uh, screeches to a halt and the, the Brits scream foul and that was a violation of international law, the, the question is, yeah, really? So like what international law? So we'll, we'll see where this goes. The clear trend is in favor of sovereignty. Due diligence is another hot button. Uh, it has appeared in uh, all of the reports to date, always has a voluntary non-binding norm of responsible uh, state behavior. At least two countries have come out and expressly said it is not yet a rule. Those countries are Israel and Argentina that I know of. Uh, most other countries that have spoken to the issue, most recently Japan, uh, have embraced the rule of due diligence. I have to tell you, as I wander around uh, and talk to government officials, part of the problem is extraordinary misunderstanding of the parameters of the rule. The rule isn't a broad rule that says, listen, you got to stop everything that's being launched from your territory that's not very friendly through cyberspace. The rule is a very limited rule. It applies only to actions uh, into, or I'm sorry, from or through your territory. It only applies to ongoing obligations. There's no preventive obligation. It only applies if you have knowledge, actual or constructive knowledge. It only applies if the hostile cyber operations implicate the legal rights under international law of another country. It only applies if those rights are affected in a very serious manner. And it only applies, most importantly, it only applies when you have feasible means of putting an end to those ongoing cyber operations. So my, my response to folks that are nervous about it is now that you understand all the parameters, at least that the Dolan Manual Group uh, uh, placed around the, the rule, why would you not do that? Are you telling me you don't want to do that as a nation? And I think it also, there's a big failure to understand the benefits of the rule if you have an operations into your territory and you can geolocate the source of the operation, it's coming from country X. But you can't attribute it to the state, either because it's an organ of the state that's conducting the operation or because you can't find sufficient evidence to do Article 8, instructions, direction, or control, or another means of attribution, or it's just the bad guy non-state actor operating from the territory. The beauty of this rule is either the territorial state must put an end to the hostile operation, or that state, if it can uh, put an end, is in breach of its due diligence obligation, thereby opening the door to your country, the victim state, the injured state, engaging in countermeasures to solve the problem itself. Now, with regard to countermeasures, no express reference, but we did see the text that was proposed in 2017, we did see that text make it into 2021. So no express uh, mention of countermeasures, but if you read carefully, it really does uh, talk about countermeasures. The big issue for states now isn't the existence of countermeasures in cyberspace, it's whether or not countermeasures may be collective in nature. And in the NATO space, where I operate most frequently, we have a cat fight because we have France saying no collective countermeasures and we have Estonia, which is a tiny little country, but a, a, a fairly active country in the cyber context that sits on the border of Russia. Uh, Estonia saying there are collective countermeasures Many of you know uh, my friend Sean Watts at, uh, at West Point. Sean and I have just published an article in the uh, Harvard National Security Journal where we look carefully at countermeasures, uh, collective countermeasures. We conclude that both views are reasonable. There's good support for both views. We believe ultimately that the better view uh, in terms of the strategic logic and the law is that there are 
Uh, in fact, there is a right to take collective countermeasures for a number of reasons, ranging from there's no clear prohibition on them to it's consistent with the object and purpose. I will tell you, people that disagree with us always point to the famous Nicaragua case. Uh, and we looked carefully at countermeasures in that case because there the court said that basically there's no collective countermeasures. But they were really talking in that case, limiting the discussion to the use of force. And they were also concerned about a lack of requests from victim states. So when we looked at it carefully and we asked, what does that statement mean in the context of this particular case? We concluded that you could say Nicaragua says no collective countermeasures, but you don't have to say that that's what Nicaragua says. Other noteworthy issues, again, self-defense not issued, but it's crystal clear from the text that everyone accepts the premise of self-defense. One kind of uh, confusing point there, peaceful settlement of disputes came up. There are two types of obligations with regard to peaceful settlement of disputes. The GG conflates them, which is often done. The first type of obligation is when you have a dispute and it looks like that folks are going to fight over it. If that's the case, there is a legal obligation to first seek non-forceful means of resolution. You have an obligation to do that. If it's other disputes, disputes that do not necessarily look like they're going to endanger international peace and security, you don't have that obligation, but you do have an obligation to settle it by peaceful means. So slightly different, kind of conflated, not a big deal. Now, on to the Israeli position. This will be critical, and I do not mean it to be, especially if Ori had anything to do with it, okay? Uh, I think the position was sophisticated, mature. I happen to think uh, uh, that Roy Schorndorf and his team are scary, smart international lawyers. So this is not meant to be criticism. This is just a, a nap picking at this uh, presentation. So here we go. Sovereignty. No position on sovereignty expressed. Roy correctly said it's kind of up in the air and there's lots of discussion. I found it curious because he felt the need to distinguish between the general principle of sovereignty and territorial sovereignty. And that left the question for me, is that mean that if Israel believes there is a rule of sovereignty or comes to that conclusion in the future, does there, must there be a territorial aspect to the rule? And the reason we asked that is when, the reason I asked that is when we did the Tallinn Manual, we, we focused a lot on the island of Palmas, which talks about the functions of states. And we came to the conclusion that it's possible to violate sovereignty, either by the causation of effects on a territory. We don't know what effects, but certainly break things, hurt people, permanent loss of functionality, or alternatively, by interfering with or usurping the functions of a state uh, and not necessarily on the territory. So with regard to the uh, interference or usurpation of the inherently governmental functions, like law enforcement, no particular effect is required, whereas territorial uh, violation does require it. So there the question isn't, he got it wrong, but we'd be anxious to see what Israel's position is uh, as it begins to develop, as it forms a uh, position on this issue. Then due diligence. So this one confused the, the daylights out of me. The position taken by Israel is that there is no rule of due diligence, but uh, sometimes in life, you shouldn't explain how you got to a position. Just say that's our position. Because if you explain how you got to that position, then people like me are going to pick at it. So Roy said he, that Israel had not seen widespread practice beyond voluntary cooperation. Uh, there was no overarching opinio juris uh, by which you could form a new rule. Uh, I think there are two problems. First is, why are we talking about cooperation at all? Due diligence doesn't have anything to do with cooperation. Due diligence is, uh, in, in, in fact, those who are due diligence obligate, uh, advocates do not stay that states that have the due diligence obligation have an obligation to cooperate. On the contrary, we say they do not. At any rate, I think there's a, a, 
the mistake here was it's about cooperation in the Israeli view, and that's not what due diligence talks about. Moreover, I think there's plenty of state practice because in many cases, when there are hostile cyber operations into a state, the state takes measures. I mean, we're talking to the folks in the Caribbean and, and, and the folks that are working in their certs regularly take measures when hostile operations are operating from their territory and states regularly condemn such activities. In my country, look at Colonial Pipeline and the JBS hack with the Russians coming from Russian territory by non-state actors. And then I believe this confuses crystallization and interpretation. The due diligence people are not arguing that there's a rule of due diligence that is crystallized. We're arguing the rule has been around for a long time. For This was the very first case of the ICJ. This is Corfu Channel. We're talking about should it be interpreted to apply in cyberspace, not crystallization, it's interpretation. And I can't figure out why Israel would take this position because you have, as you know better than I, you have a mighty big problem with non-state actors anyways. And this would open the door of, for Israel to respond into other states against those non-state actors. IHL, uh, Israel takes the view on the issue of attack. Attack is important because the rules do not attack civilian objects, do not attack civilians. Those rules only apply when there's been an attack. Israel takes the view that you must have physical damage or injury before a cyber operation is an attack. It rejects the view that uh, the loss of functionality constitutes damage such that the cyber operation resulting in a loss of functionality, even permanent loss of functionality would be an attack. I'm delighted because Israel took the view that I first championed in 2002 in a very famous battle with my very dear friend, Knut Dorman at the ICRC. I was arguing you have to break things and you have to hurt people. And it was in a, an article uh, that kind of went viral called Wired Warfare 2002. But the good thing about getting older and as the introduction demonstrates, I'm mighty old at this point, is you get wiser. So I wrote a follow-on article called uh, Rewired Warfare and most recently an article called uh, Wired Warfare 3.0, again in the review. And there I adopted the permanent loss of functionality. Uh, approach that we had developed in Tallinn Manual, in the Tallinn Manual. Uh, I, I do have to wonder why would Israel take this position? Maybe it will take the position because it wants to retain operational flexibility in, this, in the battle space. But on the other hand, then it doesn't criminalize the activities or not criminalize, it doesn't render the activities coming into Israel to be unlawful. And then finally on data, there is also a big debate on data. Uh, and the issue is, is data an object? Why is that an issue? Because if data is an object, we have a rule that says don't conduct cyber attacks against data. And if you destroy or alter data, then, and it's civilian, that would be an attack on a civilian object. Again, Israel took my early view. I wrote about it in Yuval's uh, journal. Uh, the Israel Law Review, in which I argued that data is not an object. I, many smart people in that same journal argued the other way. Um, I think both views are reasonable. We're now seeing states like France kind of figuring out a middle ground where France talks about content data being an object um, and process data not. Now there's no legal reason behind this. They just say that. But I think that that's a reasonable view by Israel. The problem is that reasonable view will have very bad humanitarian results because it opens the door to really taking on the civilian population. So with that, I'll turn it over to my friend, Ori. Thank you very much, Michael. Ori, please. Thank you, Michael. Uh, So firstly, thank you uh, very much for uh, providing me the opportunity and the privilege uh, to respond to Professor, Sh Professor Schmidt's um, fascinating uh, presentation. What I'd like to do is make a few observations, um, starting with some more general remarks on the identification of customary international law, and then with time permitting, maybe address a few more issues um, in a pinpoint ma manner. 
So beginning with the with the identification of customary international law, and this is something which, which Professor Schmidt em emphasized that we're in a new domain of some sort. We have new activities which did not necessarily exist in the previous, uh, previous uh, decades. And the question arises, well, how do we identify relevant customary international law, um, which is um, applicable to the circumstances? And here I actually forgot to emphasize that these are solely my opinions and do not necessarily uh, reflect any of the organizations I used to be affiliated with. But I think another important point to make in this regard is that the discussion here is not only uh, one which arises regarding cyber operations. For instance, there's a there's very interesting project ongoing at, um, if I'm not mistaken, the University of Groningen in, in the Netherlands regarding uh, the identification of rules of interpretation of customary international law. And it seems that many scholars in regards to cyber operations do take an approach that customary international law can be interpreted in order to accommodate itself to new circumstances which were not necessarily foreseen when the customary international law developed. And this is the point which I have fundamental disagreement with. And I would make, I, I, I would add a caveat here that I personally am very formalist in my approach to international law generally. So reasonable minds can, can, can disagree. But adopting a formalist position, this does not do justice to the identification of customary international law. What's very interesting is that in the recent discussions in the IL regarding the ILC's, ILC's, um, ILC's project on the identification of customary international law, there was almost complete consensus among states of various regions around the world that customary international law is to be identified on the basis of state practice and opinion juris, nothing more and nothing less. So the moment we move towards interpretation, I feel that we are kind of losing the two element approach since it means that something else is involved. Now, does that mean that new circumstances are not, are never to be, uh, are never to be governed by existing rules of customary international law? On this subject, I also, on this question, I think it depends on the circumstances. And there are many circumstances in which the rules of customary international law will apply. The question is how we identify whether previous circumstances in which the customary international law crystallized and developed are relevant to the new circumstances that we are discussing. In this regard, I find it very interesting that often the ICJ and the PCIJ's jurisprudence on the subject is often overlooked, although the ILC actually did provide perhaps short notice of this jurisprudence in its conclusions on the identification of customary international law. In this regard, we should go back to the Lotus case and not to the more um, controversial part of the Lotus case, but a couple of pages later in the case in which the I PCIJ stated the question as to how, what practice is relevant for its determination whether in the circumstances of that case, there was a customary obligation on Turkey not to prosecute Le Lieutenant Demond um, for the high seas collision between the Lotus and the Bos Court. And in framing the question, in framing the test relevant for an answering the question, the PCIJ stated that the customary international law is to be ascertained, and I quote, by examining precedents offering a close analogy to the case under consideration. For it is only from precedent of this nature that the existence of a general principle to the particular case may appear. So basically what we're looking for is practice which has very close similarities, though not necessarily the same kind of practice. Now, in the Lotus case, for example, the PCIJ excluded instances of practice regarding prosecution of, um, of incidents occurring on a single vessel or, or incidents of prosecution occurring on a state's land territory, ultimately concluding that there was no customary obligation prohibiting the prosecution. Later ICJ cases are even more revealing in this regard. In the North Sea Continental Shelf case, where the question there was whether there was a customary rule of equidistance in the delimitation of the continental shelves between, on the one hand, Netherlands and um, Netherlands and Denmark, and on the other hand, um, the other hand, Germany, which had adjacent coasts, the applicants, or Denmark and the Netherlands in that case, relied on various instances of practice, including delimitation between states with opposite coasts. 
the ICJ stated in that case that the precedence of practice regarding opposite coasts were irrelevant. Fast forward to a few years ago, in the jurisdictional immunities of the state case between Germany and Italy, Italy argued that there was a exception to immunity, state immunity regarding territorial torts. In that case, the court framed the question not as whether there's a general exception to immunity regarding territorial torts, but rather whether there was an exception to immunity regarding acts of armed forces during armed conflict on the, on the foreign state's territory. And in that regard, it came to the conclusion that there was insufficient practice. Now, in all these instances, the previous practice had certain similarities to the, later, to the, to the case which was being adjudicated. Yet there were significant aspects of the practice which were different from the case at hand. And this, I believe, should be the test that we apply regarding the identification of rules applicable to cyber operations. So take, for example, due diligence, where the classic examples of transboundary harm are, for instance, we had the Corfu Channel case of the mining in the, in, the, in, the, in the Corfu Channel, or the Trail Smelter case, which was essentially pollution, all these involved physical damage uh, to another state. Whereas in the cyber context, the circumstances of malicious activity causing transboundary harm are very different. On the other hand, if we take, for example, the prohibition of the use of force, the practice has been so general with various different circumstances where the practice has placed emphasis on the result deriving from a certain activity rather than the means employed, that it can be fair to say that the significant differences between using a cyber means to cause um, physical damage rather than using a kinetic means of any sort is not significant to render there to be a difference between the different circumstances. With the time remaining, I'd like to also make an additional point uh, regarding sovereignty. At this point, I very much agree with Professor Schmidt's analysis that, of course, there is a rule of customary international law, there's a rule of international law which prohibits violations of sovereignty. However, I think using the term sovereignty in this regard is somewhat confusing. And to quote the late James Crawford, who actually argued that it's simply incorrect to speak of a rule of sovereignty. There are various rules of international law uh, which, which protect sovereignty, and one of which, which also dates back to the Lotus case and was also applied in the Nicaragua case, and more recently in the Costa Rica versus Nicaragua case. There is a rule of international law which prohibits the extra territory, the, the exercise of state functions in the territory of another state. In this regard, I, I, I certainly believe with Professor Schmidt that the UK's um, position in this regard is somewhat perplexing since it kind of leaves aside the existing um, international law and uh, jurisprudence which has exi existed up until then. But I think the question does become more interesting the more we zoom in to what is this rule, what is the nature of this rule governing the prohibiting the exercise of state functions in the territory of another state. I think what's firstly what's very interesting is that this rule predates the existence of customary international law in, in, in many respects. It almost goes back to the Westphalian era. But I think what is also interesting, and this is how we would rely on um, Georges Abissab's Hague lectures, um, general course of the Hague Academy, that the rule prohibiting the exercise of state functions in the, territory, in the territory of another state is one which reflects the factual realities of the Westphalian order in which states could generally prevent other states or other bodies from exercising such functions in their territory. And therefore, international law recognized this ability of state and basically upgraded it to the status of law. If we fast forward, uh, if we look at, for an example, um, literature relating to um, this in the space age, when questions of sovereignty uh, began to arise in various aspects regarding space exploration, many number of scholars placed emphasis on the question of whether states can or cannot prevent the exercise of functions 
in various territories, whether in their own territories or whether in um, whether in outer space regarding the, the application of sovereignty regarding the application of sovereignty to celestial objects. Another interesting example in this regard relates to the use of radio frequencies and radio waves, where I think the, the, the better position, or at least the, the more overriding position, was that states do not have exclusive competence, states do not have exclusive competence relating to the use of radio waves in their territory, because states simply cannot exercise exclusive competence regarding such use of radio waves. So applying this logic to cyber operations, the question would then arise whether states have the ability to exercise exclusive competence regarding cyber operations. Now, of course, for example, the Chinese uh, would argue that they can uh, with their great firewall of China, but then again, it's very quite straightforward to overcome the great firewall of China in regards to the uses of VPNs, encryption, Tor, and other such and similar, similar, similar means. So I think that the jury is out there whether it is possible to apply this rule of taking of exclusive territorial competence and applying it to cyber operations. So again, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and uh, I'll give it back to you. Thank you very much, Louis. Uh, Michael, do you want to quickly respond before we open the floor? <laughs> so this is why I love and hate coming to Israel. <laughs> In most countries, you go to the country, you give a talk. The only thing the people ask you is, would you mind signing my copy of the Talon manual? That's all that ever happens. <laughs> At any rate. So, I mean, I think I agree with almost everything Ori said. I don't know. I think the presentation suggests there's greater disagreement than exists between the two of us. With regard to the rules of interpretation, I kind of sort of agree with Ori. I mean, my approach is much simpler. I ask, is the state interpreting in good faith? And one of the aspects of good faith is, in fact, analogy. And that's why we are having so many debates about how to interpret the threshold of, for example, sovereignty breach, how to interpret the threshold of use of force, how to interpret the threshold of self-defense. It's because the activities are not precisely analogous that we're having that discussion. So I, I think we need to look in good faith at the analogy issue, and I think we have to ask the question, is the interpretation that we propose after doing this, is it consistent with the object and purpose of the underlying rule? So I don't disagree with much of what Ori said at all. It's a much more sophisticated way of saying what I already think. This is the difference between Hebrew University and Texas State University, where I got my master's degree. With regard to due diligence, I think there is a little problem. No one is saying that the rule of due diligence necessarily applies to operations that are not physically damaging. Because what we said was that the rule of due diligence requires serious adverse consequences. That's important, severity, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a primary rule of international law. So we're not saying non-damaging, we're saying you first have to figure out what the primary rule is. And maybe the answer to the primary rule is sovereignty is only violated when there is physical damage. Maybe the answer to what is the threshold for use of force, maybe the answer is, well, you have to have physical damage. So I think the criticism of the, uh, of the due diligence report on that basis doesn't ring true until we solve the primary rule issue. And then I, I listen, Ori, I couldn't agree more on the sovereignty issue. I think what people don't, first of all, in terms of, of terminology, the reason we use sovereignty is just because that's what people say. And we're writing a manual, not a treatise. When we started, we specifically said, I could care less if someone at Hebrew University reads this manual. I do care a lot 
if someone at the IDF or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Ministry of Justice reads it because we are writing to those individuals. So we simply adopted the terminology that was that is used you know, by those folks. But your point is very well taken. But I think the thing to remember about sovereignty is there's almost no agreement so far among those states that have said there is a rule of sovereignty or a rule of whatever you want to call it. The only state that's really spoken to this issue is, uh, as you know, with any granularity is, is France. And so we have the French telling us it's causation of effects on French territory. When I asked my French colleagues, okay, that's cool. Great, I, I agree. That's my interpretation, but what effects? I need to know what effects. Of course, if someone destroys something in France by cyber means, of course, that's a violation of sovereignty. But what if, for example, there's a cyber operation that merely causes cyber infrastructure to operate in a manner in which it's not intended to operate? What if it slows down? What if the operation is temporary? Da, 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 da. You see where I'm going here. So <clears throat> on the sovereignty, and by the way, on use of force, and by the way, on self-defense, and by the way, on attack in IHL, uh, in all of these cases, the only thing we're saying is let's focus on the issue at hand, which is not the existence of such a rule, but how to interpret, how to do exactly what you talked about in the beginning of your pres presentation. And there, the Tall and Manual Group and I, we have some views, but they're far from definitive views, far from definitive views. At any rate, I think I'll stop there and let folks uh, have a chat among themselves. Thank you, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I'm just uh, letting you know that we're already getting, getting requests in the chat for you to sign copies of the NATO, uh, the new <laughs> 2.0. So it, it can also come here. So. <laughs> uh, we have a first question by Yuval, please. <laughs> yeah, I want my uh, blog post uh, also signed. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so, so here goes. I mean, in terms of due diligence, um, f first, I mean, did you see it coming in any way um, during the telling process? I mean, we had a lot of back and forth on sovereignty. Uh, we didn't hear a, a lot of back and forth on due diligence, which is quite surprising. At the same time, I mean, you could say that these are two sides of the same coin in the sense that if states want to have a more or less a fair kind of regime where there are uh, fewer constraints on their activity and basically treating um, low level cyber attacks on uh, under the radar screen, maybe it makes sense to look at two, uh, both ends of this so-called transaction. So, so this is on due diligence for, for, for Mike. I, I wanted to react quickly. Uh, well, well, to Ori, I agree with Mike on the issue of uh, uh, thresholds. So I think, I think you, you, the radio waves analogy doesn't really work well when you have, um, when you do uh, have um, activity that is actually uh, causing physical harm. Uh, so, so, so I think it's re it really begs the question of what constitutes uh, an unlawful conduct from one's territory, wh which would be regulated. Uh, and I think that the due diligence standard would have to be some sort of um, uh, extrapolation from that. So there I'm not persuaded. Uh, there is an issue on exclusive territory, uh, territorial jurisdiction, and here, uh, I, which Mike, I think, seemed to agree with. Uh, I want to push both of you perhaps back on this. I think uh, we, we're no longer, I, I don't think anyone seriously talks about uh, uh, sovereignty at this point in time as an exclusive uh, regulatory regime. I mean, human rights certainly doesn't uh, provide exclusivity to the, to the, you know, the state in question. I mean, the whole business and human rights discourse is about non-exclusivity. Environmental law has these features. So, so, so I think, uh, I mean, really barricading oneself in this field of, of cybersecurity uh, around a notion which is, I think, completely out of sync with how uh, interstate relations at this day and age operate. I, I think this is somewhat of a straw man. So I would be somewhat, uh, uh, I, I would like you to react to this. I have some doubts as to whether this is really the standard that should be applied. Thank you. 
So uh, let me answer your question, Yuval, on due diligence. Did we see it coming? Yeah, we actually did see that coming. This was a hold your breath piece of the manual. And the reason was is exactly because of what Ori said. Because although this was Corfu Channel, and although that Corfu Channel was physically damaging, we then moved to trail smelter and so forth, and that was an arbitration. And, and really, that body of law developed in the context of environmental law. For example, where we got the term serious adverse, that was in fact from trail smelter. We drew that from trail smelter. So frankly, we... We did that. We all agreed that it applies, that it was reasonable to do interpretation by analogy, but we, we certainly held our breath on, on, on that one. Uh, and that's why you see all the caveats. I will tell you, interestingly, uh, when we met with states, we met, I, I think I, I mentioned, we met in, with states three times in The Hague. So we, we, the Netherlands, the government of the Netherlands, the MFA invited all these state reps uh, to come and Israel had a big delegation and a very vocal delegation uh, as well. And we also invited comments, uh, written comments, and we got thousands of written comments from states, including uh, a behemoth of a document from, uh, from Israel. Uh, not, not, folks didn't really push back on due diligence because of this, we're expanding what is really an environmental law concept uh, into general international law. <clears throat> the pushback had to do with severity. And I remember a representative, a superb attorney from, from my country, a superb attorney came to me and said, Mike, man, do you know what you're asking? You're, uh, you know how many cyber operations come from the United States every single day, and you think we're supposed to stop all those, we cannot possibly accept this obligation. So the pushback was in terms of, 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 uh, severe, uh, of, of the, the, the weight of the obligation. And that's why we emphasize serious adverse, implicate a right, not an interest of another state and so forth. And that's what motivated me I wrote it within a week, the piece in the Yale uh, Law Journal on uh, uh, defense of due diligence in cyberspace to not only explain the limitations, but also to explain the dynamic. Because I said to this super attorney, I said to him, dude, I mean, we're getting attacked all the time by non-state actors. This is your door to justify your response to other states where they are seeking sanctuary. So yes, yes, due diligence, you've all, we all kind of went, oh, I don't know if this one's going to fly. But when we got the pushback from states on the issue of sovereignty, we made the decision at that point to press forward because we had addressed so well the issue of sovereignty. I'm sorry, severity, rather, I'm trying to say severity. Uh, I agree 112% on the issue of it of non-exclusivity of sovereignty. I agree absolutely. Not only with the operation of the inherently governmental function, it, you know, we say that this is without prejudice, the application of human rights and so forth uh, and other bodies of law, but also with respect you've all to intervention. Because remember in intervention, you have the two criteria, coercion, and you also have uh, domain reserve. Um, and the domain reserve is, is that area left to states by international law, and of course, it doesn't leave human rights to international law. So I agree with you completely, and I would tell you during the Tallinn manual process, we would do the same. We did not mean to suggest uh, exclusive uh, jurisdiction. So for, just to give you a really quick example, assume that a state uh, is suppressing freedom of expression in its country. Okay, and it's doing so pursuant to law. In our view, that would be a violation of international human rights law. And therefore, if another state took action to provide access to, for example, the internet, the global internet, uh, to individuals in that state or who, who are trying to express themselves, we felt that that would neither be a violation of sovereignty. Uh, again, sovereignty, the threshold is weird, but neither ever an intervention of sovereignty nor intervention into the internal affairs of that state. So thank you for making that point. Ori, you want to also respond? Uh, yes, okay, so, so thank you for those questions. 
Uh, regarding due diligence, I would say that we would be entering into a perhaps more borderline, even, even I would be prepared to say that perhaps due diligence would be violated, um, um, provided that the other circumstance of the violation of due diligence would occur if there was to be a physical damage. But I think at least today, the, the emphasis, the, at least the, the, the typical instances of malicious cyber operations, particularly by non-state actors, are not those which, which create uh, physical, uh, physical um, effects on the territory of another state. Those instances of cyber operations which had potential to create physical effects, such as the, the Iranian, the purported Iranian hacking of, of the uh, New York Dam, or the changes in um, chlorine levels in, in Israeli water treatment, uh, tr treatment, um, treatment uh, facilities have essentially been, been state, uh, state um, activity. So in this regard, I would say that perhaps due diligence can be violated, um, but the, the threshold um, for, we, we haven't seen anything near the threshold of, of physical damage yet. Regarding sovereignty, uh, firstly, I certainly agree that, uh, that in framing it as an issue of exclusive state competence in its, in its territory, of course, this does not come to, to take away uh, from, the, from the state's um, obligations under international law. And, and echoing uh, in this regard, uh, what Professor Schmidt um, said on the subject, However, I think the moment we get into instances in which we have states exercising functions physically in the territory of, of other states, I don't think it, we have seen any development um, in, the, in the law in this regard. Essentially, for example, just in 2015, the ICJ's conclusion that Nicaragua violated Costa Rica's uh, territorial sovereignty was basically comes inside that framework. Of course, it could also be... Um, also be classified as, as a even a violation of the use of force, but but based on that framework was was the was the ICJ's conclusion. So I think even though we have seen many developments in international law uh, regarding the concept of sovereignty and the state's freedom to act as it want as it as it would like, ultimately the when it comes to the nitty gritty of a state exercising state functions, not for example commercial functions of, of any sort in the territory of another state then that would, would amount to a violation of, of, of the rule of territorial integrity or territorial sovereignty. If, if I can come back for just a moment on the due diligence point, because Ori makes, uh, um, asserts that it's the physical damage that matters, but that's kind of problematic because we first have to understand what the internationally wrongful act is. So let me give you an example. Uh, an operation is conducted into the United Kingdom. It is physically damaging, but the physical damage that's caused is relatively minor. Uh, the, the, the damage that's caused, I, I meant to say, does not quite rise to the use of force level. So you have uncertainty or it's not a use of force. If you're the United Kingdom, there's no rule of sovereignty. And so the question would then be, nationally wrongful act. Because if you focus on the effects, then what that would mean is that the territorial state would have a legal obligation to put an end to an operation that if another state conducted that operation would not violate international law at all. In other words, the territorial state would have a greater obligation than another state that is using its territory or its cyber infrastructure. So that's what folks forced us into saying, it's not about a particular type of effect, it's about, a, it's about an internationally wrongful act. And then we have to answer the follow-on question of when is the internationally wrongful act violated? And it also, I think this emphasizes the interconnectedness of all these rules. Having a due diligence rule without a sovereignty rule means due diligence in most cases it doesn't matter so much, for example. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question will be by uh, Yasmin. Please, Yasmin. Hello. Um, my question is to Professor Schmidt. Um, I'm not asking about due diligence. I'm asking about something else that will actually help me understand uh, more of uh, your personal opinions. 
At the beginning of the Zoom, you said that you're from the few people who look at the old laws and that you're trying to apply them to the current situations, and one of them is cyber. And I actually see a paradox in that, because <laughs> if we're looking about older laws, then we should apply them to modern situations, and the cyber and the is a modern situation that it needs uh, to be applied by or newer laws or older laws. So as I'm also, um, sorry, I'm quoting McAfee, may he rest in peace, who say that wars are not gonna be blood anymore. They're gonna be uh, technology, they're gonna be hacking, they're gonna be uh, drones, and they're gonna be many other things that the IHL can actually apply to, to it. And as a person who, sees that the older laws should apply to current situations. Why do you see that the IHL is is giving the report a minus that it's in the report? So I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I'm a sort of an IHL junkie. I, I, I think people always sell IHL short and IHL is meant to be an evolving body of law. And we know this because of article 36, which is the weapons review requirement uh, found in the protocol, which most countries, including yours, see has in part customary. So maybe you could refer. So I believe IHL does apply. I believe it does a pretty good job uh, of governing cyber operations. Here at the War College, we think a lot about it. Uh, there are just a few points, in my view, there are just a few points that are hard. Uh, data attack, the points that I mentioned. But Yasmin, maybe you could uh, refine your question a little bit. I like IHL and I think it works well in cyberspace in most cases. No, no, you, you, you say that uh, like mentioning the IHL in some of the parts of the report was not a good thing for the report. So. Oh, no, I think. I'm, it's, I'm, no, I'm sorry. I misspoke myself and I apologize. I, I think it was great that they did it. And here's why. I think the debate over does IHL apply in cyberspace is one of the stupidest debates that I've had since I've been practicing law. I mean, are you kidding me? We have the United States DOD Law of War Manual and the ICRC claiming that IHL applies cyberspace. When you get the United States Department of Defense, Office of General Counsel, and the ICRC, and by the way, I would add the IDF, all agreeing that, that IHL applies in cyberspace, uh, then you're there. I remember when we, uh, when we were talking to uh, states, I went and made a presentation to the GGE and the Chinese guy was there with uh, his attorney and they said, they made the pitch. If, if we say IHL applies, this will legitimize the use of cyber during armed conflict. I went to them and I said, listen, I want to legitimize cyber. Why? Because of the requirement to take precautions and attack. Because that means I may have to use cyber in lieu of kinetic operations that may have more humanitarian negative consequences. Let's start there. And then secondly, if you guys, you PLA guys, believe that cyber doesn't apply during armed conflict, I'm sorry, that IHL doesn't apply during armed conflict, that the very use of cyber during armed conflict would be counterproductive. What in the world are all those Chinese cyber forces meant to do? They're in the, they're in the Chinese army. So I, I apologize, Yasmin. My, I, I think it's great that they mentioned IHL because now at least we can quit having the stupid discussion of does it apply and have real discussions like the ones that, that Ori and I are talking about. What's an attack? What's an attack? How do I find the appropriate balance between humanitarian considerations? When I interpret in IHL, I look for a balance between humanitarian considerations and military necessity. How, what is that balance in the cyber context? What is that balance with regard to cyber operations that are meant to alter or destroy data. So I'm, a, I'm an IHL uh, advocate and I'm delighted they finally mentioned it. I mean, come on. The, the 2015 report, are you kidding me? You mentioned four IHL principles, but you don't use the term. Do you think there's anyone out there that doesn't know what that means? Come on. Thank you very okay. much.
our next question will be by uh, Asaf Lubin. Please, Asaf. Hi, both. Uh, so great to hear from both of you. Um, I, I wanted to drill down some more into the territorial exclusion point and follow up with Yuval's question and your responses to it. Um, I, I tried to take notes of the way you responded and understand from that what your views are. And it seemed what I wrote down, and please correct me if I, if I got it wrong, but is that the, the three approaches that have been thrown around the table today is that the French approach about effects in the territory, what Ori had proposed, which seems to be some kind of state action, which historically can be fended off under a Westphalian model, that's at least a, that how I understood it. And then I, I think interestingly, what, what, what Professor Schmidt had suggested is, is that the action in question is tied to some kind of a violation of an internationally wrongful act, which, which I thought was interesting. And so A, correct me if I got these responses right, but B, Taking that specifically to the issue of the prohibition on enforcement, um, extraterritorial enforcement action, how would you treat certain investigative action by the FBI or any other law enforcement agency which seeks to install network investigative techniques on the computers of people around the world or say to, um, uh, to uh, tackle down botnets, bringing down botnets um, by the use of certain cyber means. So the activities of law enforcement in this space, is that is are these the kind of rise to the level of a, a violation of the, the prohibition on territorial exclusion as you understand it? So, there are, I, I, let me re-attack sovereignty a little bit. There are, in my view, two ways to attack sovereignty, by causing particular effects on the territory of another state and by interference with or usurpation of exclusive uh, inherently governmental function, which is the answer to your second question, which I'll get to next. It has to be done by a state. And it in other words, it has to be attributable to a state uh, under the law of state responsibility, Article 4, Article 5, Article 8, uh, and so forth. So only states violate the sovereignty of another state. I will tell you there is one country in the world that has made the assertion that non-state actors can violate the sovereignty of another state. There was one country that I know of that made that assertion. If you think really, really, really hard, you'll figure out what that country is, okay? In my mind, that's simply wrong. The internationally wrongful act requires, the Articles of State Responsibility tells us you must have breach and attribution. So I, I think that's, that's wrong. Uh, and then we get to the threshold issue with respect to territoriality. Take, dispensing with the British, there's no rule at all. There, I don't know the answer. At one end, we have the French saying, you mess with French government infrastructure at all, that's a violation. If you cause effects, I don't know what they mean by effects, that's a violation. I would imagine there are states that say, listen, you have to physically damage things. You have to break things. You have to hurt people. And there's lots in between. So I'm a sovereignty guy, I've got to tell you. And so if I do my interpretation, subject to every word that Ori said in the beginning of his presentation, I think if you cause things to happen in other states, then that's a violation of sovereignty. If the Chinese make this computer quit working, I think that's a violation of sovereignty. But I don't know that that's the right answer because law professors don't make law. I got news for you, Asaf. You don't make law, okay? So I know you think you do. I do too, but you don't. States make law. Well, we have to watch this space and see what states say. So I don't know the answer. I don't know, there are more than three gradations. There are lots. I've heard all sorts of things. However, however, when we get to your issue, the second issue, here we have a lot of consensus among the states that accept sovereignty. And it is your example is the example everyone uses. And that's extraterritorial law enforcement. The Dutch, by the way, raised this very issue uh, in, its, in its statement on international law when it sent a letter from the MFA over to the parliament, you can read that. In my view, in my view, law enforcement is an inherently governmental function and it is the exclusive 
subject to everything my friend Yuval has said, the exclusive right of the territorial state. And so therefore, if you want to conduct law enforcement activities on the territory of another state, then you have to get that state's permission in one of two ways. You have to ask them, do you guys mind? Can we do this? Or you have to have a standing agreement to do so. And the classic example here would of course be the Budapest Convention, which has in certain cases, provides for law enforcement activities in another state without the express permission of the state. But for example, when you have the owner of the data gives you permission, the owner of the system gives you permission. To me, that's the classic violation. Now, are there gray areas? Oh, you bet. Of course there are. So what if I'm the FBI and clearly if I'm searching into your computer and I'm the FBI without the authority of Israel, to me, that's a violation of, of sovereignty. If you're in Israel, I don't know where you're at now, but wherever you're at, uh, the FBI uh, does it as long as you're not uh, in the States. But what if, for example, the FBI conducts a search into the, in, in, for criminals uh, on the dark web, okay? Now, where is that search actually being conducted? Well, it isn't being conducted in the States necessarily. It might be conducted someplace else because the server may be someplace else. So when the Tall Emanuel group came to that, what we said is yes, but that along with the regular internet is meant to be accessible in the country conducting the search. And so therefore it is not usurpation. Here, we're not talking interference. Here we're talking usurpation of another state's inherently governmental function. But I've got to tell you, you know, the dirty secret of the tall manual is the same as making sausage. Okay, it's not a pretty process, and we made that up. Uh, I saw Deb uh, is here. I see Deb. Hi, Deb. I mean, she'll remember there were times where we said, we just don't know. We just don't know. And we think that this makes sense because it wouldn't make sense for the contrary, for me to be able to sit here and, and, and pound on my computer in a way that is, it wouldn't make sense, but maybe we were wrong. Maybe we were wrong. But the classic search, the classic seizure of cyber stuff in another country, in my view, it's a violation. Uh, in, interestingly, uh, when, uh, when the Brits came out with this uh, wrong statement, uh, at Chatham House. Chatham House convened a group of uh, five of us. We came there, and so all the key players are there. And I cannot say it was a non-attribution, but someone who used to be very highly placed in the British uh, legal system looked at the architect of this particular uh, view and said, are you telling me that now other states can come into the United Kingdom and conduct law enforcement activities on our territory, perhaps remotely, perhaps in person. And I mean, what, what, how do you answer that? You can't, you can't. Good question. Thank you very much. Uh, Ori, you also want to respond? Um, yes, please. Um, so I'll first respond to Asaf's uh, co um, question, comment, and then I'll uh, also make a, one short comment uh, regarding something uh, Professor Schmidt that said. So yes, I think you actually framed what why my opinion quite well. I wouldn't necessarily say how historically what states have been able to exercise um, their exclusive competence regarding, but I think it's more of a factual question what states can today exercise their exclusive competence generally, the general experience of state. I would also add that while I have not seen this argument made in regards to cyber operations. You do see the argument made back in the day when space exploration was taking off, such as Rolando Quadri in his Hague lectures on what he termed international cosmic law. So although it may sound a bit novel in this regard, I don't think it's actually such a novel idea to, to begin with. And yes, uh, a very much agree with, with Professor Smith that, that, that the FBI example is the paradigmatic um, example. However, I would actually say here that as long as states are not able to exercise um, the exclusive competence, at least regarding the internet, I think the issue of closed, um, closed networks in the territory of one state is, is somewhat different. 
In such circumstances, I don't think the uh, state's territorial sovereignty, or what I think is more uh, precise territorial integrity, would have been violated. One short comment uh, regarding uh, Professor Schmidt's statement on non-state actors uh, being able to violate uh, territorial sovereignty. So actually, I would note here that I personally very much agree uh, with his position that only states can, although I can also imagine which particular state it was which made the argument that that is not. But I would actually also add here that I think the the state practice, or at least opinion euros on the subject, is somewhat more complex. I think if we look at the Kosovo advisory opinion, you see a very interesting split among states, which argue that the Kosovo Declaration of Independence, for example, violated the sovereignty of, um, of, of Serbia, whereas other states, such as uh, I think the United States, the United Kingdom, argue that that no, that no, no such a violation. So I think I still agree on the law that that uh, only states can violate sovereignty. However, I think the um, there is a greater diversion among positions of states than as uh, perhaps uh, implied. Thank you very much. Uh, given time constraints, we will listen to our two last questions, slash comments together, if it's okay, and then we will uh, hear. Finally, from uh, Professor Schmidt and Ori. Uh, so we'll begin with a question by uh, Gadi, and then we'll move to a question by Yali. So please, Gadi. Uh, hi, uh, thank you both for very interesting uh, uh, remarks. Um, just one thing before I say my question, I will say to Professor Schmidt that the Budapest uh, Convention states, signatory states have allowed internal laws to uh, um, conduct searches in cloud data which may be out of their countries even though they were signatory to the convention saying that it only needed consent it didn't matter they still created laws contradicting it so the budapest convention is nice on paper but asking about things that are nice on paper and um, i i think the problem is i i don't see a, a solution for which makes a lot of what we talk about theoretical is a problem of attribution at the end of the day we um, states have a, a serious problem openly uh, accusing another state and being able to prove it at least at an international level due to the fact that first it's a self-incrimination we don't want to say that the reason we know it's another state is because we hack their own systems even worse off we hack third-party systems we've been hacking whatsapp security we've been hacking facebook security we've been cloning total systems and this is why we can attribute everything to iran so Nobody talks about attribution, and since you never have attribution, you can't apply the next steps, which are due diligence and, and sovereignty. So we get stuck there, and then the question is practicality. You're talking about being a great fan of IHL, but we're not even there yet. Um, how can you apply the law if you haven't even proven that you've been attacked by another state and it can't even go to war? Uh, even if it was a really physical attack and everything, because you really can't go there. So. I, I, I guess it's a question of why are you still a fan? Um, uh, if, if I need to be provocative. Are you sure you just don't want me to sign your book? I mean, I can just sign your book right here. If, it, it might be easier. My it was actually Gabby who asked. Who asked I asked to have you my talent copy signed. I was the first one. <laughs> Yali, please. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for, for a really interesting presentation. I, I, I just want to move uh, beyond the, the uh, specific legal discussions and ask uh, what's next. Um, you, you seem uh, rather positive about the outcome of the, of the last GGA, but uh, in, in terms of, of uh, hard law, there isn't much there. And so it seems to be dependent on future developments and, and how come uh, we can be sure that uh, we won't be back in 2016 really soon? Thank you very much, Yali. Yeah. Uh, Michael, maybe uh, if it's okay with you, maybe Yuri can uh, respond first and then we can have the last word by you, if it's okay. <laughs> Please, wait. So firstly, regarding uh, the, the interesting question on attribution, I would just say here that I think it, the issue is more apparent than, than real. Um, firstly, 
international law to begin with is, is a system of, of, of problems of enforcement. Um, and, to, and to place the emphasis on, on enforcement to begin with um, I think, I think is, is somewhat problematic, but, but more, more fundamentally, I think that ultimately in any circumstance of international law, a state takes upon itself the risk that it is considering the factual in, um, situation incorrectly. Um, so for example, a state may adopt countermeasures in, in the context of, uh, for example, classic examples of, of aerial agreements and services. It's taking the risk that perhaps international law hasn't been violated and therefore the countermeasures it's adopting um, in response um, are, are, are themselves actually violations, not actually countermeasures and therefore violations of, of international law. So I think ultimately a state with the factual information which is available to it just has to take the risk upon itself and respond, uh, respond likewise. And um, regarding the next steps uh, forward, to, to be honest, it's very, very hard for, for, for me to, uh, to, to say, um, but I probably a reconstitution of, of the GGE, and you could only, could only hope that they managed to, to, um, to at least expand a bit upon, upon some, of the, some, of the, some of the statements which were made. But I think that really the way forward is, is less the GGE and more of these statements which we're seeing that more and more of them come out um, on state, on, on the ap application on international law by uh, ministries of foreign affairs, ministries of justice, even uh, defense ministries. And on the basis of this really um, build upon and try to determine where, where the law is heading. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, if you want to make a general concluding statement also, we'll be happy to learn anything you want to share. Sure, sure. Uh, so it's wonderful when you have an event and you have two people speaking and they, they end it by agreeing 112%. So I agree with everything Ori said, 112%. Uh, yes, there are problems with attribution. They, the problems with attribution are to some extent exaggerated. And even if we don't ha have an ability to attribute to directly to a particular actor, we often have an ability to attribute to a particular location. So even though we may not be able to attribute to the state, if you embrace due diligence, you could say, I know you claim you had nothing to do with it, think Estonia, but it came from your territory and that we did know. And by the way, we got this rule of due diligence because I was at the Fetterman uh, event with Schmidt and he convinced me. So at any rate, uh, that's attribution. With regard to IHL, I think your point's well taken, but it's well taken with regard to the use ad bellum. It's well taken with regard to use of force and so forth. But once you get into the battle space, once you're involved in an armed conflict, the issue is not who did it. The issue is whether it's a military objective. And that's what you need to know. Now, that presents some problems because when you're trying to determine whether or not it's a military objective, sometimes you have to attribute, but sometimes you don't. I don't need to know who conducted the cyber operation against me to know that those individuals, whoever they are, are directly participating in hostilities. So I think once you trip from ad bellum, where the, your problem, Gadi, is acute, to in bellow, I think the in bellow context resolves some of the issues. So what's next? Uh, wow. So the UN, everyone tells me that the UN is going to continue to do this. So kumbaya, okay? Uh, I think talking is good. So I like the idea that Michelle Markoff, the US representative tweets, thank you to her Chinese, by name, Chinese and Russian counterparts Thank you for cooperating, blah, blah, blah. So I think that's good in and of itself. But I could not agree more uh, with Ori. The action is going to be in state statements. Countries like mine are eventually going to have to quit hiding behind uh, the grayness of this body of law and take a position. And the reason is because countries like Finland, who are willing to issue granular statements are having more influence. By not issuing statements, states are ceding the discussion uh, space to other states. It's, it's much easier to present the view than to argue someone else got it wrong and this is why post factum. So states are going to have to do that. Of course, they are doing that 
with respect to the GGE, they're issuing their statements, read the very granular Japanese statement, which was spectacular because it agreed with everything I've ever written. So I liked it very much. And then finally, I mean, how can we possibly conclude this without saying, I mean, you know, look at the manual, look how worn out it is. You know what we need? We need a new one. And so therefore, uh, we have launched a project uh, sponsored by, again, the NATO Cyber Center to do Tallinn Manual 3.0. It is a five-year project. Uh, we brought on two people to serve. I'll be directing again, but we brought in two people to serve as co-editors because anyone with a CV as long as Tall mentioned is getting really old and needs to go to bed early. Uh, that would be Marko Milanovic and uh, from the University of Nottingham, super scary, smart guy, Ijo Talk, and Liz Vihul, who is the CEO of, uh, of a cyber law company in Estonia and who was our managing editor, they'll help. The, many people have asked about the process. We're going to spend a couple of years working with a team from NYU and Just Security to capture state pro practice and statements and catalog it. Uh, Marco, Lees and I will write the first drafts of, of the manual. Then we will convene a new group of experts, the composition of which will be driven by two factors, diversity, geographical diversity, and expertise in those areas that require the greatest revision because we wanna bring in stars. We will, the IGE will, uh, will decide about the text, the final text as was done. We will then convene under the sponsorship of a number of states. We've been approached by at least two so far. I haven't decided who we'll go with or whether we're gonna go with a group to convene states in a process to assess the work. And then uh, presumably five years, we will issue uh, Tall and Manual 3.0 and, uh, that will be the time where we will actually address the most important, the most important question uh, that we have, which is what color will the cover of the book be? We have done blue, we've done green. If Beige. you have news on that, you can write me at m.schmidt at utexas.edu. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, to you. It's a real pleasure because I know when I come to, to Hebrew and, and and Fetterman and anything to do with Danny and uh, Yuval, that I'm going to get really, really great intellectual exchange. Let me assure you that's not always the case. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come into your computer today. Thank you very much, Michael. And if it's okay with you, since it's the last session of the year, I just want to say, uh, to send out a big thanks to all of the members of the Fetterman Cybersecurity Center uh, we have with us people who have been going with us all around uh, throughout the academic year, uh, regardless of the time zones, uh, be that Asaf in uh, Indiana or uh, Daphna in Toronto. And we've been uh, lucky to host with us governmental uh, and military uh, experts during our meetings. Today we had with us Cedric Sabah and Noah Morris who joined us. Uh, in addition, uh, we have with us Izzy Brunner, uh, which we are still waiting to come to Israel. Uh, the invitation is still uh, open, Izzy. <laughs> and of course, uh, and we have a new uh, research, research associate, Eduardo Jimenez, uh, Eduardo Iglesias Jimenez, uh, which is joining us from uh, Spain. So, uh, bienvenidos, uh, Eduardo. And uh, I want to note uh, Deva Housen Curiel, uh, a member of our advisory board, uh, which has been working very hard during this year in promoting the center, uh, be it a very uh, useful index of all of the cyber materials re regarding Israel and other projects which is promoted. It is an honor and delight to work with you, Deb. So thank you very much. And last but not least, of course, uh, Yuval, the director of the program. Uh, thank you very much, Yuval, for letting me join you. And it is always an honor to follow your lead. And I don't, I know you don't like uh, that I adopt you, but be, the, uh, be that as it may, uh, you are my academic father and I'm sending you a big virtual hug. So thank you very much. And, and of course, Tamara Goen, Akoen, which is with us uh, in the shadows, but a little bit also hopefully more in the future in the spotlight. So thank you very much, Tamara. 
And apologies for the ones I didn't mention in person. Uh, you would have killed me for being that late. And best of luck for Yali, which begins a new journey in Haifa in the next academic year. But we hope to continue seeing him here with us. And thank you very much to everyone. A big hug. Thank you, Tal. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Tadeh. Thank you.